Hello and welcome to Making Life Brighter. I'm so happy to be back with you and uh, loving this spring. I have to tell you, we're lining up and getting ready for the big eclipse. Look out, because here in New York State, uh, they are having quite a, a preparation um, panic over this. And it is going to be mayhem. They've asked people not to go out. They've asked people not to drive. They're fearful that the cars will be backed up for 12 hours at a time on the highway. They've been sending the state troopers in preparation to have um, water and things for anyone that's stranded. <laughs> and they expect some kind of really intense fallout after the fact. So whatever is happening, it's going to go right overhead here. And uh, yours truly will be holding focus in a loving capacity and maybe getting to see something if it's clear, but uh, there is quite a stir going on around this. And you know, there's a lot of change happening in our world right now. So what can we do about this? Nothing, we can focus. However, today I have a very special guest and this special guest is not like one I've ever had before here on Making Life Brighter. Oh, and I'm very excited. Please welcome Joshua Shapiro. Welcome, Josh. Thank you. <clears throat> um, for your listeners, I still have a slight cough, so it may affect my voice or I may cough a little bit, but it's not going to deter me. I'm a typical Aries. My fire is up here, and I've been waiting to do this interview <laughs> with Winifred for a while. So now that we have time to do it, yeah, I'm it's excited. Exciting. It's, yes, it, well, I'm, I had the cough first, and it took a long time to get over this cough. And so I applaud you. I'm glad we can finally come together to do this. Now, let me give you a proper introduction. First of all, today we are talking skulls. Yes, we're scullies. And uh, that you may not know about me, but um, I've worked with crystal skulls for a while. I've done a lot of brain reformatting with the one that came to me, and that's a long story for another day. But today we're talking about Joshua and his journey with the crystal skulls, which is magnificent. And he's written a book called Journeys of the Crystal Skull Explorers. And that is a beautiful big book that you can get. And he has many surprises for you today that you can also get, and you'll be very happy to hear that. But this is going to be a compelling conversation because we have discovered that we have some interesting um, things in common. And so, Joshua, welcome officially, and thank you for bringing your expertise and your journey of the skulls and your discovery through your lifetime of what these magnificent creatures are, because they are sometimes man-made and sometimes not man-made. So let, let's begin with your journey into this book, first of all, Journeys of the Crystal Skull Explorers. How did you even begin? Well, how I started with Crystal Skulls is I have uh, one of my original books I wrote, Journeys of an Aquarian Age Networker which is back in 1982 or 83. And I went into a metaphysical bookstore in San Jose, California. And I was talking to uh, the owner, Francois, who actually had a son that had the same birthday I did. And she called it the Ram Metaphysical Bookstore because she was Aries, I'm Aries. My birthday's coming up next month. And her son had the same birthday as I did. So I kind of felt like in a past life, she was like my mom. So we had a, a very nice connection. So anyway, I went into her store one time to see if she needed more copies of my first book. And she pulls out this picture of an amethyst crystal skull. And <clears throat> it really affected me very strongly. Um, I started to feel like a inner vibration inside, like an inner earthquake. And then I believe as I was looking at this picture of the skull, which she actually had in her home at some point, there was a real earthquake in California, in Kalinga, California, which is about 150 miles south. And <laughs> I could feel the table 
moving with the picture on it. So it's like an inner and outer earthquake. So for your listeners, this is key. Whenever there's going to be some type of event in your life, that's going to be very important. Because see, at this point in time, what do I know about crystal skulls? You know, I saw Arthur C. Clarke's Mysterious World, where he had, um, I think it was the British crystal skull was on there. And then in the introduction, he had the Mitchell Hedges crystal skull. You know, so it's interesting. But who am I to think all of a sudden these are going to become something major in my life? Because everybody knows me now as a crystal skull explorer with over 40 years of experiences. Or right around this time in 1983, which would be 40 years, is when I meet the amethyst skull. And to me, that's the beginning of my journey. That's why I bring it up. Well, the the skulls kind of find you. That's what I've learned. I didn't expect this either. This was not on my trajectory of things to work with <laughs> or even um, heal with, for that matter. And I've done a lot of healing work with the one that ended up on my doorstep. Um, I've talked a little bit about that in past shows. If people want to go back and research Einstein, the crystal skull, Carolyn and I talked about it because the skull that I have entrained next to Einstein in his Kiva in Arizona, and then ended up being a real helpful tool in brain reformatting and, and, and working in healing. But I never expected that. So with you on this journey, you sort of stumbled into this and you had an earthquake type experience. What happened right. after that? And then the skull in the picture starts talking to me. <laughs> and it says... We are returning now to assist humanity for world peace. And so, Joshua, now that you know that we're coming back, what are you going to do about it? So this was like a telepathic communication with the picture of this skull. So it's like, you know, what's happening here? What's going on? I got to try to figure this out. Aries, as an Aries person, we do not like... And it's happening again, especially after my beloved Katrina passed in November. I don't know what the heck is going on with me. I have an archangel that's standing behind me. I think his name is Zadriel. And he's saying, everything you've ever wanted in your life, it's going to start happening now. There's nothing you can do to stop this process. It's almost the same thing like I feel what's happening with our planet right now is that major positive light work from creator, from source, is getting ready to manifest here. I know this for a fact inside of myself. There is uh, one of my free ebooks. We're going to talk about all the free ebooks I offer. It's called Messages from Argus. I talk about in that free ebook my two profound experiences that show me without any question whatsoever. And I'm, I'm pretty sure that being around the crystal skulls, this opened me up to receive these messages and have these experiences. Well, were you, we are were you definitely going to- prior to, to that? Uh, what is that? Were you intuitive prior to that? Yeah, I think so. I think so. Do you it's think a, that's opened you up since then, since the beginning? Well, the, the crystal skulls most definitely have activated my gifts. Katrina's passing has further activated my gifts, which is driving me crazy because I'm hearing messages more, more clearly than ever before. And, um, you know, and all of a sudden I'm meeting all kinds of people and things like this. So it's just like everything is getting ready to to blossom, to explode. It's so the amethyst, yeah, right, so the amethyst, amethyst skull. skull Right. So the amethyst skull was the beginning of this journey. A picture was speaking to me, okay, from the consciousness that works through the skull. And that's my understanding of it now, 40 years later. But when it was happening, I don't know what's going on. So I just know there's something about the skull. Then I got to meet the skull in person. Uh, a local art gallery um, had the skull in a vault. And some wealthy guy comes into town. This is San Jose, California. And so I'm invited to this meeting and I get to touch the skull. And I feel its energy go all the way up my arm. So I'm having all this connection with this amethyst skull. And <clears throat> that's what got me to be more interested, to pay attention, 
shall we say. And then just over the years, more crystal skulls show up. This guy here, he shows up in 1999. My Brazilian wife, who's wife number two, I've had four wives now. Katrina was the fourth, although she was a spiritual wife. We, we weren't married legally, but we were, we were married. Um, you were heart so, married. Yeah, so a soul partnership. And it's and it's only stronger now. It's like, you know, we're still connected. She's still helping me. She's sitting on my right shoulder here, listening to everything we're talking about. And she will have comments to make, I'm sure, at some point. Right? Right. Okay. So um, this crystal skull I received from my Brazilian wife as a gift. So this was really the first major skull. Is that a that quartz in. or is that a citrine? It, it's smoky quartz. Okay. When I received it, it was darker. It's more light now. Can you turn it sideways so we can see it sideways too? In case? <laughs> yeah. If it doesn't disappear with the special thing. Oh, I it's beautiful. And, and he's 10 pounds and I'm shaking, holding him because he's a little bit heavy. So anybody saw the Indiana Jones film where they had a skull bigger than this and they were throwing it around. It was fake. There's no way yeah. I could take this and throw it. I can't do it. Okay, I, it's impossible. I can I, just, you know, like throw them up in the air. That's about it. You know, a couple of inches. Yeah, and I have done that's that. A big skull to have, and Ted is even bigger than that. He needs his own suitcase. Right. I mean, these are no that that is that's significant. You can almost feel the weight of it. But there, to me, now, okay, guys, I'm going to go out on a limb here. When I see you hold that. To me, mm -hmm. I can not only feel the weight, but I can feel, say, the intelligence of it. The oh, weight yeah. of the intelligence, right? It's it's like a data keeper. Right. There is a living consciousness inside. His name is Portal de Luz, Portal of Light. And he's, whoever is the consciousness is galactic. Because my true essence is galactic. Okay. I you know where you come from. Well, the only thing I can tell you is there was a book called Other Tongues, Other Flesh by George Hunt Williamson, who was an early UFO contactee in the 1950s. And when I read the book, he talked about the cosmic wanderers, which he says is the 144,000 that we have reference to of a group of 144,000. So I resonate with the cosmic wanderers because look at Okay, I'm putting him down because my hands are shaking. He's heavy <laughs> and he's channeling all this energy to send out to all the people. Will you take a break, please? That's how we have conversations like that. It's like talking to a person. Oh, you know, I except know. He calls all people, me dead. All people that do this, they know. <laughs> right, but he calls me dead. So he he's kind of like my kid. I don't have any children in this lifetime. However, Zadriel is saying, when you go through the med beds, see, we're talking to your people about other things that are happening behind the scenes. This is real. I, I know these things are real. When you go through the med bed and you lose 30 years, you're going to be able to have kids again. And I actually already talked to a lady and I won't say her name or anything. And I told her that we may have a child in the future. So I don't know if she was pleased about that because she's already having trouble with her own daughter. You know, right now, who's, I think, in her 20s or something. And I said, don't worry about it. By the time this happens, we're going to have help. Everybody's going to love each other and support each other. And we're going to have the Center for the Advancement of Humanity. See, I'm, I'm all over the place here because there's so much that's going on right now. Um, this center that Spirits asked me to create, we're going to have that in place. And it's going to be all over the planet. That's what I see, so. And the crystal skulls will play a key role in that. But anyway, it was the amethyst skull that got me started on all this. And then Portal de Luz <laughs> really is the first personal skull of any importance that came to me through my Brazilian wife. She gifted him to me, which happened at a crystal skull conference I was a speaker at in Sedona in 1999. And I have met the person who carved Portal de Luz. He's a Brazilian carver. Leandro da Silva, who's fairly well known, he's done probably thousands of skulls. And um, he was asking me when I met him, because, you know, 
he's making them, but he doesn't know why our people want them. What is the purpose? So I was trying to help him to understand how the crystal skulls were helping people in their spiritual growth and evolution. Because that's what I see as their main purpose. But then in the future, uh, we're going to have some very old skulls that have existed probably with humanity for thousands of years that are going to come to us with special frequencies of energy and information and all that. And some and that aren't that, even discovered yet. I mean, well, well, most of, some, some reveals upcoming. Right. Most of these advanced skulls haven't been haven't come out yet because humanity is not responsible enough to deal with them yet. And what do you think these skulls are? Like, what do you think all crystal skulls do? Well, I think there's a number of purposes that they serve. So I'm just going to go spontaneously as they, as these ideas come to me. Okay. So the first idea that comes to me is <coughs> that if the skull has a living consciousness inside of it, then it's able to receive cosmic knowledge and information, higher frequencies and energy. So it's able to hold those frequencies within the stone it's made from. Now, Portal de Luz is quartz crystal, and that's the crystal, the stone I know the best. But there are other skulls that are made out of every stone that you can imagine. And different people have affinities for different stones. And I've seen that because, you know, Whereas one person loves Portal de Luz, if I have, let's say, the rabbi who's made out of, um, what's that blue stone? Uh, lapis lazuli. Thank you, Katrina. See, I don't need to remember things. She knows all this. So I just ask her and she tells me. So lapis lazuli, you know, which is a completely different stone. And my reaction to the two skulls is completely different. I don't have very much conversation with the rabbi. It's more of an energy field with him. Whereas Portal de Luz will not shut up. He just keeps talking all the time. So this is my experience, you know, with them. Um, so one of them is just, you know, their receptacles that they're able to hold these higher frequencies and help people in their spiritual growth and evolution. Healing is another purpose the skulls seem to serve. So like some of the skulls, when people have these private sessions, I do intuitive sessions, they'll receive a tremendous energy and healing from, I call them the crystal kids. That's what I call our collection of third. And I say our, because even though she's not here, she's here, okay? And I'm hoping whoever is going to come into my life and Zadriel says, don't worry, you will have a new partner or, something else which i don't know can't explain it our life's not going to be the same when we go through all these changes so we'll just say whoever's the new partner i need help how am i supposed to take care of 30 plus girls when i can't even take care of myself that well <clears throat> well i'm sure it'll all work itself out then again you might be um dialing back in time so it's not something that you're gonna have to worry about for too long i'm sure we Probably. seem to be coming into this cosmic window yeah. And the, the window is opening to more frequency. So if these skulls carry frequency and they transmit frequency, what do you see as the purpose or what are you seeing with your own sale of skulls, the purpose well, that people well, are reaching for? Well, again, the main purpose right now for the people who are receiving these skulls that are coming through this Indian carver, who's very talented, is it's helping them in their own spiritual evolution to figure out for their own life, you know, what what are they here to do? What is their spiritual mission? Some healing, some upliftment, activation of gifts. It just depends where the person's at. There isn't like just one thing. It's different for each person. So in other words, if somebody was to sit with Portal de Luz, they will have a completely different experience with him than I do. The ma major thing is with me, I've fully integrated with him. So there really isn't too much new things that happen around him. It's mostly a communication or he's saying, dad, you need to hand me over to this person who needs to work with me. You know, so it's, it's kind of like that. But further up into the future, well, 
if some of these skulls are thousands of years old and they were sitting and recording frequencies of energy of what happened in the earth's past, just think about the wisdom and knowledge that they have, which yeah. I believe through our center, we'll figure out a way how we can directly receive this information they have. Because for right now, it's mostly coming through a person who has spiritual gifts they can hear. I hear Portal de Luz, okay? But I don't always receive everything that's inside of him. That's why if there's other people that work with him, they may get things I've never heard before because, you know, I can only go with what are my gifts. And plus the fact he's telling me right now, dad, if you were to receive everything I have, you would become so ungrounded, you couldn't accomplish all the other tasks that you already have, which you have some inkling are starting to come up. So, you know, <clears throat> they have to also respect who we are and what we're here to do. No, so I think in, yes, go if ahead. We, if we go back to your amethyst experience, um, this put you on a trajectory that you didn't expect in life. So what happened after you touched the amethyst skull and how did you get to the, the point forward of you coming into this journey with the book? Okay, well, first of all, the book that you've showed is a more recent book. It's not the first book that was written which was called um, Mystery of the Crystal Skulls Revealed that was done with Bone and Nasserino. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Nasserino was already considered to be the expert on crystal skulls. Right, yeah. You know, so he had met with a number of crystal skulls and he had been doing research with them and all kinds of things. So uh, I thought my role in coming in there was just to be kind of like a glue to try to get some of the information out uh, from Ms. Bone and Mr. Nasserino. And then of course I was starting to have experiences. So I started to throw those in there as well. So after meeting a me, which I talked about in the book, I also think by the time the book came out, I had met the Mitchell Hedges crystal skull. So I was sharing something about that one. And so, I think I also had met another one called Max. Oh, yes, yes, yes. I met Max. I met all those actually at the 11, 11, 11 event in L LA and um, more. It was, it was wild. So when you, let's recap some of those stories, because that's really important. Those are known major crystal skulls. And some of them they feel weren't made here on earth. They weren't carved by carvers. Um, they were ancient and kind of kept by keepers in some of these cases. But when you had the experience with those skulls, what happened then in, with those that you can remember? Well, with the ones that we would consider to be, I'm going to call them very old. And the reason I use this terminology is because people tend to go crazy around, oh, I want to get an ancient skull. That's what was a term that was used, which I think Mr. Nasserino coined for these ones that are thousands of years old, ancient. So a lot of people say, oh, I want to have an ancient one. I only want to see an ancient one. Well, my 40 years of experiences with the skulls is that every single one, there are no fake ones. Every single one has its own unique frequencies and energies, okay? Now, I know, and I have met some skulls like connected to Mexico, that they were involved in man's inhumanity to man. And so it doesn't mean that every crystal skull that exists is always going to offer a positive experience. It's the same thing with people. If we travel all over the world. You're not gonna meet every single person you meet, at least in this point of time. In the future, it will be so, but not in this point of time where everybody's going to have a positive uh, effect upon you. Some people, you're not going to like them. They're going to insult you. They're going to do terrible stuff with you because that's just where the planet is. So it's the same with the skulls. They're just kind of like, I believe, neutral. And if they're surrounded by man's inhumanity to man, where they were sacrificing people, taking their hearts out, putting skulls in there, they're going to record that frequency of energy. <clears throat> but I think the ones that are extremely old were either created by very advanced civilizations that existed on the earth, Atlantis, Lemuria, or they were gifts from the gods as the indigenous people 
talk about, like the Mayans say, the gifts from the God. And when you say God, that, you mean they came from off planet? Off planet, yeah, gifts from the gods, the extraterrestrials, or there's another name for them, which you'll have to ask me about this later, the extraterritorials. Okay. Which are the same thing, I believe. So, see, there's a lot of different things that I've been studying. I'm not just into crystal skulls. And it's like I have all these different pieces and I'm trying to put them all together to figure out what's really happening in our world and where are we headed. So, um, so like the Mitchell Hedges skull, did you find that to be um, a particular experience versus the others? Did you find one more powerful or potent for you? Because each one, you know, people have that different interaction, like you're saying. Right, right. So for me, so far, of all the crystal skulls, including Portal de Luz and any of the personal ones I have, that I have met, the one that I've resonated the most and had the most powerful experience with, which doesn't mean anything, it's just for me, was the Mitchell Hedges skull. And it has to be the case because I believe I knew that skull in Atlantis. And if what I'm receiving is correct, I was one of its guardians in a sacred temple that it was in. So naturally, it's going to reach out to me and it's going to have an effect upon me because it knows my soul and my spirit very well. Like, let's look at the first time I saw this go was at a conference in Dallas, Texas. So Anna Mitchell Hedges, she was alive. She was the guardian at that time. We're talking about mid 1980s. So she has a, a table that she's sitting at with this go. And um, but I think this wasn't the first time I saw it. I think there was a party where, because I was connected to Nasserino, who was also a speaker, I was kind of like one of his helpers with Sandra Bowen. So at the party, she put the crystal skull on a table, and it was like, I thought it was there. I could feel it was there because I'd studied it by pictures, but I couldn't see it. And then Sandra came up to me and said, aren't you going to go over to the table where the skull is? And sure enough, it was there. It showed me it could make itself invisible because I'm sure I looked there and I didn't see anything. Okay, so I went over to it and then um, I saw the skull the next day at her at her booth. And while I'm talking to people, because I have some knowledge by this time of crystal skulls, you know, having experienced the me and having studied the <laughs> British Museum skull, and I think I'd seen Max by this point and the Mitchell Hedges skull and new skulls, you know, so people are asking questions at her table and I'm answering them. And then she says to me, now this was a clue what I told you had to be true. So, oh, I got to go somewhere and do something. Could you watch the skull for me? So I'm sitting there <laughs> behind the Mitchell Hedges skull and I'm not making this up and I'm not just saying this to impress people. She asked me, Okay, I'm an honest Aries. I'm not going to tell you stories that didn't happen to me. She asked me to watch the skull. So this is how I know it's trying to tell me, hey, buddy, I already know you. You were already my guardian before. So it's perfectly natural that you should be sitting there watching. So the skull, I think, worked through her to give me this message. And I also noticed, too, I think I hurt my hand at work. And I noticed while I was around the skull, it seemed to be healing faster. Okay. Yeah, they so, say that. So, People say that. In fact, you know, you you sell skulls and you have the little ones and, and medium-sized ones and things. But little ones are kind of things that people carry around, they put in their pocket. Or they can put it in their palm and kind of hold on to it. Whatever absolutely. Stone. Absolutely. So, and there's a lot of... I call them guardians, not owners, guardians who do that. They go out into their day, go into work or whatever, and they have in their pocket their skull with them. So it helps to give them a good energy for the entire day, a protection, or, you know, just helps them to guide them, you know, like um, what, th what things should they be doing during the day too, you know. So the bottom line is these skulls, is a tool to help a person to live a better and happier life and know who they are 
themselves. But in the future, they're going to help Mother Earth. This is what I've seen a vision of. And I actually have um, a story I wrote called Crystal Skull Chronicles, where this happens in the story, where thir a set of 13 skulls come together in Brazil. And collectively, their energy just like this bright light goes high up in the sky and totally covers the entire planet in this light. And then there's total peace on earth. That's what's in that story. Now, is it possible this could happen? Yes, it is possible that it could happen. It's possible that if they are gifts from the gods, as I'm hearing Katrina remind me, then, um, you know, they could be placed here by our galactic family, our cousins, you know, to plant higher frequencies of energy in a sneaky way. Because unless you're <laughs> sensitive, you don't know what's going on with that skull. Okay, you, unless you can feel the energy, you know, or you already work with skulls, you could put one down in a, in a restaurant and it could be he, healing on some level, every person there, and they don't have any clue what's going on. That's but true. then yeah. <clears throat> somebody walks past your table and sees it, if they notice it, most people probably wouldn't even see it and go, oh, what's that? It's because they're linked in to the frequency and energy. So basically to answer your question they are a powerful tool well let's let's talk for a minute about the number 13 because in today's world right now there is a lot of uh, stress around the number 13 because of uh, the cleansing that's going on based on some of those that maybe uh, abused the real true cycles so let's talk about the real true cycles and what your take on the number 13 is because you said 13 skulls right so for everybody who believes whatever they're taught by the media and in school and everything which we're going to find out most of this is false information and the only way i can support that is you need to get the list of my nine free ebooks that i offer and all that stuff's in one of them okay because we don't have time to go over over that. But we've been brought up that 13 is bad luck. You don't want to be around. Friday the 13th is not a good day. But could it be that they're telling you not to work with the number 13? Because there's some people who know that it is an extremely powerful number. And it is a number that has to do with the evolution of humanity. Now, why do I say that? Well, before I go into the 13 skulls I was talking about, which is a... Um, a legend, let's say, through the indigenous people. Let's look at the number 13. So we have Christ and the 12 apostles. So you have the teacher and the student. In Judaism, which I was brought up, you have the Levites, which are the priests, and the 12 tribes of Israel. Okay. There are some people who say, if you believe this truth, that in our solar system, we have the sun surrounded by 12 planets and that there's a couple of other ones like George M. Williamson in his book, um, Other Tongues, Other Flesh. I think he talks about this with a planet in front of Mercury and possibly two beyond Pluto. Because <clears throat> we have, um, what is it? <clears throat> I can't remember. Well, the they're name. saying that even even in this solar eclipse event, that Nibiru is going Nibiru. to appear. Yeah, right. And Nibiru. That's part of what the the bastardization of these numbers right. and, and the the proper that, cycles they're using. Right that, right. that Nibiru is beyond Pluto, mm -hmm. and it doesn't have a circular orbit. It has an elliptical orbit, mm -hmm. which means that it can cross the paths of the other planets also. So, so anyway, when we studied this one around 12, we find that we already have in our culture different things that disgust us. So it's the same with the crystal skulls. According to the legends, there is a master skull. And this is what Mr. Nasserino talked about in our first book, Mystery of the Crystal Skulls Revealed. A master skull surrounded by 12 other skulls. They even talked about that this Michael Kent, who also was in that first book, was this amazing cosmic channel, talked about that he had contact with the inner earth people and that they have the same thing. They have 
uh, possibly 13 skulls that they work with, a master skull surrounded by 12, which represent their 12 tribes that has their genetic coding inside of each one. And did they ever say where the inner earth people were located? We're not talking dumbs tunnels here. We're talking about real people that live on in the earth. The inner earth people are, are a species. They're a race. Right. But, they're under the ground. Yeah. But where yeah. do you think they exist? They have their cities under the ground. We we but have not the country or where where do you think they actually everywhere? Live? Everywhere. Why would they just be located in one section? They're everywhere. All their cities. You have to go down into the ground to a certain level. The underground, uh, the dumbs, as they're calling them, only go down like eight or ten meters or something like that. Okay. These are probably like hund hundreds or thousands of feet under the ground. Okay. There's supposed to be a city like this in Mount Shasta too, under the ground in Mount Shasta. I've had contact with somebody from there who apparently knows me on a soul level. And he's tall. Whenever I see him in my mind's eye, he's tall. And he always wants to say hello to me whenever I'm there, you know. So, but he doesn't show up physically. You know, we're talking telepathically. These these other um, residents of our world are um, showing up to some people, but not to a lot of people. There was some princess that supposedly came out of the inner earth, um, too, that was meeting people. So, you know, this is the whole point of what's coming up in front of us. It's not only we're going to fully understand what these crystal skulls are about and why they're here and how they're going to help us and help us in the future. But we have all kinds of intelligent family that's from other races that are connected to our world. And they're going to be showing up too. And they have tremendous wisdom and technologies and their love and everything to give us. And there are actually some of us who come from these people and chose to incarnate as a human being so that we could help the regular people here to not go crazy. Because there's truths that are starting to slowly be revealed, even through the major media. Mostly it's to do with um, not so nice things that the elite have been doing. You know, let's say that I don't want to create more panic and fear, but politicians are starting to talk about it. Famous people are starting to get arrested for doing this stuff. So this is all this type of living in our world. This is not what creator wants for us. It's going away. How do I know that? Because during my coma experience, when I lived in Las Vegas, and this is in the book that has the two key experiences, messages from Argus. Argus is my name in the future. So Argus talks to me, but he's me in the future because in spirit, there is no time and space, but my future is tell telling me stuff, but he can't tell me what happens between now and then, of course, otherwise I can't become him. So that's no fun, you know, like he already yeah, knows. That's okay. You don't need to know. You just get to. Well, I'm it. just saying it would be nice sometimes to say, look, I have a major decision to make. What did I decide and which one was the best? It would be <laughs> nice to know that's that. Like spoiling it on Christmas. You can't do well, that. Well, I know. I know. But I'm, I'm just saying maybe one time to do it. No, but he can't do it because then I don't become him. So. Well, you, like were, that. you were talking about um, how but we got this, to the inner earth people, though. You were talking about you were with Nick and he was kind of, you guys were touching on the inner earth stuff. And I don't know where we were going to go, go from there. Well, I don't, I don't know if he, if he ever talk, talked about that or not. It got into our book because of Michael Kent, who is somebody we interviewed. He talked about the inner earth races. I see. And I don't know if Nick agreed or disagreed with that. You know, he didn't agree with everything that we put, decided to put into the book. Well, what was it like working with Nick and what, what was his take on, on telepathically well, he, speaking well, with him? Well, I think he believed that there was an original set of 13 and I think he was having contact with the consciousness of some of those skulls. And um, I, don't, I don't really know how to 
how to answer it other than to say is that we had different opinions of things, right? It's like sometimes you make an agreement in spirit to work with a certain group of people because you each have pieces that are necessary like to make a book happen. Or in my case, it was important for me to meet him because I had access to some things that I can learn more about the skulls. But then eventually there comes a point where the way that I want to go to talk about them and share with them, it was a bit different than how he saw them. And the skulls have taught me the most important line I can ever say whenever I talk to someone and we don't agree on something. We agree to disagree. We are never going to agree 100% with every single human being that's here. We will have differences. Okay. And Creator told me this through Zadriel. I got a message from Creator one time because I was asking, Creator, how do you benefit from us? down here, we're so tiny, almost insignificant compared to the infinite universes, universes of existence that you oversee. And he answered through Zadriel, he said, why your unique experiences, of course, that's what I receive from each of you. Okay, so if it's unique experiences, it means there will not be two of us that will have all the same experiences because creator doesn't want that. He wants unique experiences even, even if we, right even <laughs> right. right if you talk to two twins they're not going to have all the same experiences either they're going to be very similar they're going to probably think very similar and feel very similar but they're going to still have their own unique experiences like one may let, let's say there's their teenage and they both are are drawn to you know different people they want as a boyfriend so one who wants this boyfriend, the other may hate that boyfriend, okay? They may not like him. So even twins, there's gonna be differences. Even if we were to meet, because there are also parallel Earths, the other us's in the other Earth, they're not gonna be exactly the same either, okay? Like for example, I talked with Katrina about this. There was a parallel Earth where we met and we did not come together and we lost a great deal because of that. Because see, she's Capricorn and I'm Aries. That's two chiefs and they don't normally get along, okay? We didn't always agree, but we were there to love and support each other. And now where she is, it's even more than it was here, okay? It's because she's already in a place, stop touching my hand, please. She's already in a place where they have total peace and harmony, okay? And she's overshadowing me with that. So it's like, so let's, what am let's, I supposed to do now? You know, now my you. heart's opening up and now I'm getting emotional, you know? So that's well, it's just, a, it's, just... It's definitely kind of advancing us to this place where there are no barriers. There's no boundaries to the conscious dimensions, so to speak, except for your frequency. And so you ended up on this journey in the book that I showed earlier to look for the blue crystal skull. Let's talk yeah, about because... that. Okay, all right, so this book is about a skull that appeared to me when I was in Peru. So I'll explain how this happened. So I was with my Brazilian wife, one American and 50 Brazilians. So she had to speak Spanish and Portuguese and English. And I think she was just learning English at this point because it was very early. I think we'd only known each other for three or four months or whatever. So there's this um, Peruvian archeologist who I had actually met before and she arranged for him to be a guide when we went to Machu Picchu. Cause I think he wrote a book about Machu Picchu from an archeological perspective. So I'm minding my own business, eating my breakfast. We're getting ready to go to, Machu, to Cusco and then Machu Picchu. And he just stands up and points at me and says in Spanish, which I had to wait for the translation, Joshua knows where there's a crystal skull in Peru. No pressure there. Going, <laughs> right, and I'm going, I do, what is he talking about? But then I get this vision. 
And I feel myself being pulled to the northern part of Peru, which I had not visited yet. And I see this, um, this group of indigenous people, because there are indigenous people that live in the jungles of Peru. And they're like walking in the jungle in a path in a procession. And the shaman's in front. And he's holding an object like this. So why would I have a vision of him holding an object like this after I'm just told I know where there's a skull in Peru? He has to be holding a crystal skull, right? But then the thought comes to me, I wonder, could it be my most favorite color in the world, which is basically the color that you're showing behind you, sky blue? So that's how it comes. And I, I don't think anything more about that. Yeah, I don't think anything more about it, but the seed has been planted. And then over time, it just keeps coming back more and more. There's this blue skull in Peru I know about. And I have to go to Peru to find it. And I have to go to the northern part of Peru, but I have no clue where am I supposed to go. So I talked to my friend Eric, who's still my buddy, and um, he has been my guide at certain points. In one of the Peru trips, he and his his wife or his life partner, which is unfortunate because his life partner just passed away too, I just found out. So we're both commiserating, so to speak. But she was there then. So there were guides for one of these trips. But he told me the places I should go check out in the north. Because what do I know? I only know like... Cusco, Machu Picchu, Lake Titicaca. These are the famous places. <clears throat> but when you go up north, these are not famous places. Okay, But there were old cultures that lived in these places. There are ruins with old cultures that were in Peru. And unfortunately, because I haven't worked on the Blue, Blue Skull book for a long time, I can't remember the name. Uh, there was the Lord of Sipan, but there's a name of his tribe. And I can't remember <clears throat> what they were called, but they have names. The archaeologists have given these older tribes names. And I think the Lord of Sipan's people, they lived around a thousand years ago when Christ supposedly was here. Now, I'm not sure if that's true, because I think all the dates of everything we've been taught is not correct. But we'll have to go with what we've been taught so we'll say they were a thousand years ago and so so i'm going from like different very old sites in peru in the north and i come to sipan which is where this lord existed and they found him buried with 12 layers of clothes he was a very he was considered very holy had people that were buried around him Looks like two men, two women. There was somebody above him with his feet cut off that was in the tomb. So they recreated the tomb, you know, when you went as a tourist. So um, this Lord shows up as my guardian and my spirit guide for this trip. And I think I was married to one of his daughters. And it could have been I had a I had a Brazilian wife and I had a a Dutch wife and I went with both of them to his tomb and I think they were both his daughters and I think I was involved with both of them somehow because the the Dutch wife saw a ring that was on display that came from his tomb that she recognized she saw a ring and said that was her ring and plus also believe this or not this was really cool this was the, I don't know if it was the second or third trip. I did three trips looking for this go. So I have to come back to the first trip. So you understand that we found something and then it guided us where to go for the second and third trip. But I think it was in the second trip, we made an arrangement with the museum that had the bones of the Lord of Sipan on display after it closed, they allowed us to come in with Portal de Luz and do a ceremony wow. around him. That's amazing. 
Wow. They must have recognized that you you were carrying light. I don't know how that happened, but they agreed. You know, the Peruvian people are very kind-hearted, okay? The only problem we have in the world is the governments. The government of Peru, they have problems with. Just like we have problems here with Biden and, and the Democrats and all this Mickey Mouse stuff that they're doing. You know, trying to explain to us, oh, we have to do this. No, you don't have to do nothing that you're doing. Okay, you're doing it to destroy this country. So, but we'll stop it there. Uh, so that was pretty cool that I was able to do this meditation. And I believe Portal de Luz was put on top of him on the glass plate, you know, because he was there. And all the, all the men, it worked at the museum. They could feel the energy of what we were doing. Well, they I think could... more importantly, they could sense the energy. So if you did that back here, most most people probably wouldn't sense that energy. But right, that... and the museum would never allow me to do it in the first place. Okay, but we got permission to do it afterward. So sometimes I get permission to do things with the skulls and these are memories I will never forget and that changed me. So going so back happened? to the first, going back to the first trip though, because we didn't finish. So eventually I meet the archeologist at Sipan and I say, my hand is magnetically being pulled here in Peru. Where the heck am I going? Oh, you need to go to the Laguna Negra. What is this? This is a sacred lagoon that's high up in the Andes Mountains. And you have to go to this city and then you take a bus to get there, okay? So he gave me where I needed to go. And then I found out that below where the Laguna Negra is, is a city called Huancabamba. And I got to meet the head shaman of Huancabamba. Somebody that I met in the city on the coast, knew him and wrote a letter. And my guide was able to arrange to have a meeting with him. So we're talking about crystal skulls are connected to indigenous elders. So I'm thinking this elder, when I start talking about crystal skulls and say, the blue skull's calling me, he's going to know all about it, where it is, where I have to go and everything. And so I was so happy to meet him. Well, first he had to tell me his stuff, you know, how like they work with the plants for their medicine and they would take people to this lagoon, sacred lagoon and do a healing with them, which is not like a healing that we've ever seen. I mean, I watched them do it and the people are yelling and screaming to get out the bad uh, spirits. So they did it differently. So, you know, I listened to what he had to say and everything. And then he then it was my turn to talk. And he said, well, his first question is, what have you seen in Peru that has, um, what's the word I want to, um, I, I don't know the word he used, like amaze me. What was the most powerful? Impacted you. Yeah. Yeah. What, impacted what me the most. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so I told him a couple of places that I had been to uh, where I had some very strong experiences. And then I said, and then I took out my photo album and I showed him Mitchell Hedges, Amis, the name of the Amethyst skull, some of the skulls I had. I had pictures. This is very interesting, but we don't know anything about it. What? You don't know any. I, I'm saying this inside myself. Obviously, I'm not going to say this to the elder. He's going to think I'm crazy. What? You don't know anything about this? I've quit my job. I literally, I quit my job to make this first trip. I've come all this way and I and I'm pretty sure I've come to the right place and you as the main shaman don't know anything about this. I was like be wild. What am I supposed to do? So then his grandson shows me this picture of the Laguna Negra and says this is where we do our ceremonies. We're going to be taking some people there. Maybe you'd like to come with us. And I'm going, I got nothing else to do here. What am I supposed to do? I might as well go with them. But as it turns out, they didn't have enough people, so they didn't wind up going. So I looked at my guide and I said, we should go ourselves anyway. Let's see what this is about. Because I'm hearing 
local people say, oh, yeah, we've seen UFOs around this lagoon. We see people walking on the water. So there's something crazy going there. You know, I'm Aries. If there's something crazy, I want to experience it. <laughs> All right. That's just how we are. I get it. I've talked to other Aries and they say the same. I said, if you had something crazy, you could experience it. Are you going to do it? What? Are you kidding me? Of course. You know, this is what life is about is to have crazy experiences. <clears throat> so we went. And of course, on the way up there, the bus breaks down. So then this is like romancing the stone, but looking for right, the, the bus breaks down. There's a chicken <laughs> under my seat. You know, it, this is totally rule. I'm not used to this. Um, and then there's this family that I become friends with. I start playing with their soccer ball with the young boys. And <laughs> eventually they go and they get the local people to help them to fix the band. So eventually it comes to some place, which is. Because the Laguna Negra is in a mountain. It's in a mountain. You have to go up into a mountain to go to the lagoon. So they live below the mountain and they have a restaurant. So they feed us and they give us a chance to relax. And then they help us to rent a mule. I think it's a horse, but it's a mule. Because what do I know? I've never really ridden. But when once I start riding this mule, I go, I like riding horses. So although I still can't do galloping, I'm not afraid to be on a horse, even if my body's flying on it and it's going a little bit fast. I'm not afraid that something bad's going to happen to me. So this must be an experience I've had in the past. Okay, Like I know with Katrina, when we lived in um, the Seattle area, they had a lot of ranches up there. And on one of my birthdays, I went and I rode. You know, this was important. Uh, I don't... I don't know if I can do it. My next birthday is coming up middle of April. But I, I don't think I'm in the right place to do this. I think I'm going to have to wait till I actually have my own horse. I can ride in the future. I see having my own horse. So you need to take a horse to go up there. So they make arrangements. So we sleep at their house. And then next day we go up. So it's with my guide and two other guides who own these mules. So spirit has told me when I come to the place, when I come to the place, what was it they said that I would know I would be in this place? Um, I can't remember. See, I would have to go back into the book you're holding to try to remember what was the clues I was given. There were some clues I was given that when I came to the Laguna Negra, I said, I believe this is the place. Spirit's been trying to get me to go to, you know, going to all these sacred places. And Well, now, see, that's just center. a teaser because people have to buy the book to, to know the clues. And this is this is right. just the, the teaser. But go ahead. Carry on. Right. You got so to anyway, when I when I arrived the first time, I just saw the clues. Oh, I know what one of the clues was. There was a skull face in the mountain. There was a skull face in the mountain. The mountain was behind the lagoon. But the problem was I hadn't come with any camping gear and I was supposed to stay a couple of days. So I had to go all the way back down. Now we're talking about probably like eight to 10 hour, you know, to go all the way back down from the mountain back into the city, you know, by trucks and horses and, and everything. <coughs> so I had to then get everything together and come back so I could stay there for a couple of days. So that's how I knew I was in the right place. Plus also my guide said for this sacred lagoon, you're supposed to go in without clothes on. So I think they turned around and I, and I did that. I just, you know, because it was like cleansing, they would do ceremony and cleansing. <laughs> and at some point I had a bottle of the water from that lagoon. Because it's like, you know, you go to a sacred uh, body of water and you'll take part of it so that you can still have it and work with it. But I have no idea where it is now because we moved so many times since I did that. Because I was doing these trips when I lived in Illinois and then I went to Europe and I was in Brazil for part two and then I came back from Europe and then um, I had a trip to Atlanta and I didn't meet Katrina on that first trip but I met her 
sister. She had two two friends that were like sisters. <laughs> and they connected me and somehow, oh yeah, so her, this one sister bought a copy of my book with Nasserino and Bone and Katrina read it in one night, she told me. And so, you know, we were meant to meet. So I met her and then, you know, there were hardly any days we were not together for over 14 years, so which is beautiful. why it's why it's beautiful, but it's very difficult for me getting used to being by myself now and yeah, having to take care of everything by myself. Now that does not preclude. I have many soul family who said, anytime you need to talk like you told me this too, you know, anytime you want to talk, I can talk, but it's different when you have that person yeah, your partner it's it's, it's a whole it's them. your other half it's it's your right. dear so right so i have to i have to watch myself as aries because aries is impatient you know like i'm every time i'm going out and meeting soul family i'm going is there somebody there just to go out and have fun with because <laughs> i haven't really found that either you'll find it it's i know come. it's in in the process it's in the process so, I figure before my birthday, it has to happen. Well, don't put That's a limit like on a it. Gift. It'll be perfect when it's perfect. No, it so has to be before my birthday. <laughs> it's got to be a birthday gift. The eclipse might be uh, taking people's attention this this round, but we'll, well see. Well, it'll still be another week after that if we're still here. So because <laughs> so, it's the 17th and that's on the 8th. You so, have us hanging on the edge of our seat with our your trip up the mountain. So you're, you've got right. some of the sacred water and now... Right, so I went back, and I spent uh, two two nights and three days there, with a tent, with two guides, and so the first idea is the next day I should climb up the mountain and reach that face, and so one of my guides showed me a way to go up, and I couldn't reach the face, so then I came back down, and then the second day I was able to see the face from where I was able to get up. And when I get when I got to that face area, I didn't feel any energy. So, um, so then I became a little bit disappointed. But then, spirit told me you should go walk because I think I saw like a dimensional door in the mountain as we were coming towards the lake. Go walk towards there. So what happened is I start walking and I stop and I look down and there's like this circle of stones. Okay. And so now this first trip, I don't think I had a crystal, crystal skull with me. I didn't. So I just felt there was something special about it. And then I had all kinds of visions. Like there was a temple here and the crystal skulls were in this temple in this area, which of course isn't there now, but it was there like, I don't know, maybe it was Lemuria or whatever. And this blue skull was one of those skulls that was in this temple, that there were other ones. And I just kind of got the impression that people could come into the temple and they could like rent a skull, you know, go into a private room and just meditate with it and work with it. So, and they were all in glass cases. And I think there were 13 of them in this temple. So I was physically sitting in the stone circle where the temple existed when it was existed when it you know it was a whole building and everything i was sitting maybe i was even sitting in the room where the skulls were now how do i know this because trip number two i come back with portal de luz because i didn't have him i didn't have him for trip number one so now i have him for trip number two and there's a picture where I put him in the center of the circle and there's this light beam coming from the sky hitting him, which I didn't see, but it's in the picture, okay? And we did a special meditation because now I'm with a bunch of people. And <clears throat> after we finished the meditation, right behind us is this huge cloud that looks like the shape of a UFO. And it only stayed there for a few minutes. And I showed her, do you see that? <laughs> and there were a couple of people who didn't participate in our meditation, which also the young people's father was a shaman. He guided us in part of it too, speaking 
the tongue that they talked in this area, which was not Spanish, obviously, probably like Quechua or something. And my friends in the campsite, they also saw that cloud. It's very obvious what it was. Okay, so I know that this area has a lot of UFO activity around it. But then we heard, and I think this was on... They say the it first... was a, a landing ground at one point in time, right? It was kind of a... No, this is another place that was in Brazil. Alto Paraiso, they say, is a landing place for UFOs. But I even, don't think... Even in Peru, they said at one point well, that there was, there was kind of like They're talking a... about Nazca. They're talking mm -hmm. about Nazca, where you see the UFO uh, being and the flat area where they land, this is not in the northern part of Peru. So this, this is all is, mountainous region. This is all mountainous regions, okay? So you're not gonna find this here. Now, it could be that a UFO could go into the lake and sit under the water. Yeah, That's there could be a portal possible. in the water. They, I've seen that happen in Malibu. It went right in, off the right. cliff into the ocean. In Lake Titicaca, the people there told us they have seen spacecraft go into the water and come out of the water. Yeah, I've seen that okay. myself. Now it's this crazy. Laguna, I don't know if it was big enough or not to do that, but I think it was in the first trip, some young children came by and said that this old person who I guess passed away spoke about a city inside of the mountain. So in the last trip, when I came back with my Dutch wife, we went up to the mountain and we think we were up to the door where the city, where the door to the city was. Well, did it look like a door or was it just kind of like a, a portal feeling like there was? No, there was kind of like a, a door shape. In other words, was guy. it like something that if they undid it and they did an archaeological dig, would they find an actual structure? I have no structure? idea. I have no idea because these people are like the inner earth people. And they're not going to want you to find them. Because if archaeologists find them, what are they going to do? They're going to interfere in their lives. So they're completely hidden. Right. But we had this <laughs> sensing that there were, it, it was kind of, it felt similar to how I felt with in Mount Shasta, a Lemurian city, possibly, mm -hmm. that was in this mountain in Peru, similar to what was at Mount Shasta. So Basically, a story comes to me that the people from the city, they brought out the blue skull and they brought it to the Lord of Sipan, who had it for a period of time. And then his, his son-in-law had to bring it back to where it was supposed to go. You were the That's what I was showing. I was the son-in-law and I was asked to bring this crystal skull back and Amazing. I was guided to this area and <laughs> gave awesome. it to the people in the mountain because they were the guardians for it. So that's kind of the story that, that came up to me. So it's in the book. I was in an altered state when I was writing this stuff. So I'm not going to remember it even now. But it's I know in the that book. happens, right? You're in the flow, and right. it's almost like you're a, a right. channel, a flow through for right. But what no, here it's doing. But this is the most important point. The blue skull is not in our physical reality. Right. It's in a different dimension. I always see it like above me at a forty-five degree angle, and when I want to show the skull to people, I will offer my right hand, and it will come sit on it. And some people have been totally blown away by the energy that hand holds. By the way, this is also the hand that held the Atlantean crystal ball that Dr. Brown found. All right, That's I was going to come back to that. We have to yeah. talk about that. So let's let's just go there because we definitely need to talk about this orb. I held that orb too, which is part of this communion that we figured out we have. And this is kind of a rare experience to have held a crystal orb that came from Atlantis that was from Atlantis where we both probably were. And uh, go ahead, tell them what you okay, what so happened. First, this, phenomenal. This, first, the story of how was the crystal ball found. So Dr. Brown was working with Jacques, um, not Jacques Vallée, this, this French guy who does these underwater excursions. 
I forget what his name is. Okay, this is a problem when you get to 68, you forget the names of things. You're talking and about so, Jacques Cousteau? Jacques Cousteau. There we okay. go. Thank God you remembered. Okay, so <laughs> I knew it was Jacques. Look at, but it's not I just have to interject here for a minute. When I was a kid, I saw the same TV program you talked about earlier in this, and I freaked out. When I saw the skulls on that program, I zipped around my house at 500 miles an hour, and I kept talking about the ancient crystal skulls and my family was like what is wrong with her <laughs> yeah i i remember and jacques Cousteau was on tv all the time at that point so yeah right. he was I, always on so dr <laughs> brown went on with one of his expeditions in the bimini area and what they know is when there is a huge storm the bottom of the ocean is revealed so dr brown decides to put on his gear go under the water and he sees an Atlantean temple there. So this temple gets revealed from the storm. So he finds a way to get in and eventually goes to this huge room that has tall chairs and big table. And um, from the ceiling is um, a, rub a red ruby hanging by a metal pole. But on the table are these hands holding a crystal ball. And so a voice speaks to him and said, take the crystal ball and leave and never come back again. So he does what they say and he takes it. And I'm sure they probably didn't find this temple again after that. So this was probably meant to be. The problem he had with the crystal ball is it had such a high vibrational frequency, most people couldn't tolerate it. And strange thing, strange phenomena were going on with it. I heard a story say that the military wanted it and they stole it from him and it would disappear and come back to him. I heard okay. that. He told me that. And I don't even know how I got the opportunity to hold it, but he let me and I, I couldn't <laughs> believe it. I, I felt like I'd gone home in a way. Right. I understand. Right. Yeah, right. it's true. They, they, well, of course, because you know, they want power. They wanted power then they want right. power now. So exactly. it's a, it was, powerful this and that right. wasn't but what this big maybe right i mean it wasn't yeah it wasn't that big, it wasn't that big and um so how i'm seeing it is dr brown has passed away and somehow this military guy has the ball he somehow got it from his son and i don't know what the particulars were i just know that energetically he didn't seem like he was the right person to have it but the center on the last island in the Florida Keys, Key West, a spiritual center, they had an event. He, me he knew who I was. He immediately came up to me and said, put your crystal skulls away. I don't want it anywhere near the ball. They're different frequencies of energy. I don't want any interference. So of course we did what he said, except I had a small one in my pocket, which I didn't tell him. I'm never gonna do what somebody tells me, okay? It if I feel something else, I'm going to do something else. So then we came too late because we were traveling a big distance. We were coming from Atlanta. And this is like about a 14, 15 hour drive. We broke it up. We stopped in Miami. There was a person I knew in Miami. And then uh, we stayed there and then we went. But Katrina drove all the way back. I, I can't believe she did it. I never could do, do what she did. I, I don't think I hardly drove at all. Okay. And um, so when we got there, it was too late. So we were able to participate in a meditation. So he put us in a circle and he would stand behind us holding the ball. And then he would do something behind, which I had no idea. So then after that comes, after that finishes, he comes up to me and says, hold out your hand like this. So I do. And he puts the ball in there and I go, why is he doing that? I don't know this man. So apparently some force working through the ball recognized me probably, you know, hey, he was guardian of the Mitchell Hedges girl. He probably worked with these balls too. So he puts the ball in and then I do a meditation and everybody's behind me. Now I did have a vision, which I was told by Zadriel is a future vision that has not happened yet. Okay, I saw myself standing next to two people. So I don't know yet what that means. I don't know if this is a future mate or just some person I'm going to know or something like this. 
but I had a specific issue and I thought it was with Katrina, but after she passed, I heard, no, this is a future vision that hasn't happened to you yet in this lifetime. But the key was I could feel the energy of the ball versus the energy of the skull. They're not the same. The ball to me was programmed. Okay. Interesting. If it's, pro if it's okay. programmed, then it's going to, um, it's going, my energy is going to activate it in a certain way and every other person is going to activate it in a different way. Whereas the skulls, you have a living consciousness inside. Yeah. Okay. So let's define that a little bit. Cause I felt that too, just so, you know, when he let me hold it like you, which was really weird and, and kind of off to the side, like, well, I'll let you hold it. Come on over here. I held it and I can honestly tell everyone that what you just said is absolutely true. It did not feel, it felt powerful. Like it was a remnant of what they used to right. direct energies, but it did not feel um, God-centered, light, right. sweet, spirit, powerful. Right. So when I say program, it's like how we program our computers. Some Atlanteans wrote some kind of program in it to activate the quartz. And that quartz was still functioning from the program of the Atlanteans. Whereas with the skulls, and it can be that some of the skulls have programs in them too, but in general, they seem to have a life force or a consciousness, a living consciousness. Like, you know, Portal de Luz is sitting here next to me and I hear him, he's talking to me. Who is this talking to me? It's a living consciousness, okay? And for me to relate to that living consciousness, I have the name Portal de Luz, Portal of Light. Okay, but Portal tells me, hey, dad, if one of my uh, elder brothers or sister skulls, like a Mitchell Hedges or a Max or whatever, if they want to um, come into me in order to share their frequencies with people through me, I will step aside so they can do that. So I've, I know that for a fact, he's allowed the Mitchell Hedges go to come into him. <clears throat> because there was one time where we bought Bill Holman, who's the current guardian of that skull to Seattle. It was in 2016. And there was a place where Bill Holman, you know, was at his table with the Mitchell Hedges skull and Portal de Luz was at another table, like directly across. And they were talking to each other and bouncing energy. And then Portal was sending the energy to me. So it's like, what are you guys doing? I'm getting all this energy from you. And I was trying to focus on sharing Mr. Holman's slides that he was showing, which had to do with the original trip where the skull was found by F.A. Mitchell Hedges. He had those slides. <clears throat> and he totally supported the family on telling those stories about how that skull was found in an expedition in an ancient ruin in Belize which is which uh, used to be British Honduras. So every skull has their story and how they found their guardians. And it's a different story in each case, okay? So, but yeah, getting back to what you asked me, the Mitchell Hedges skull has affected me the most. I think that I'm a peaceful, for the most part, Aries, calm, non-judgmental because of that skull and also portal too okay i'm giving you credit to shut up and also he's helped me as well see i'm telling you it's ridiculous what he's saying to me i cannot repeat okay because well, sometimes it's... he gets foolish and ridiculous <laughs> well they definitely are um alive and living and right. just to remind everybody just to kind of go back to the book, okay? The book, which is one of many, is Journeys of the Crystal Skull Explorers. So let's let's share with people a little bit about your eBooks and then where they can get these books and, and um, how they can obtain this and study it, even okay. the other ones. So first thing I want your people to understand is when you are doing your spiritual work that makes your heart sing, you better be having a good time. I'm trying to be an example for that. As I tell you my stories and I'm enthused about it, you know, I would not be doing this if I was not enjoying it. 
it's challenging for me. I never know what's going to happen next. I never know who I'm going to meet. I'm going to Tampa next week. I'm going to do a talk. All my skulls are going to be out. I have no clue what kind of re response we'll get from the, the people there. So this is very important that when you're doing your spiritual work, you have a good time with it. Your heart should be singing with it. And um, this is how it's going to be in the future. Our heart's going to be singing with everything we do. That's why we're going to have total peace. Okay, so for the book that uh, Winifred is holding, this one you can order through me, um, although it is on Amazon, but I don't want you to order through Amazon because Amazon will steal my royalties. Okay, if I order it, I can receive more money than I can through Amazon, who will take like 50% of the book or something like that. It's ridiculous. But, you know, you have to do these things because it's the information to get it out more than it's the money. But the only reason I'm mentioning this is because for the first time in my life, because Katrina passed, I'm having to pay rent and mostly making just social security any extra i can make selling skulls selling books etc is helpful but so, also but, they get you you can sign them if that happens so that's kind of fun you get to get a book that's signed right. and so if i order the book for you and you tell me like winifred did to send it here yeah and i can sign it for you i can have my skulls around the book which See, is what now? i did i have my signed winifred. book <laughs> yeah, I did this with Winifred too. I put the book around Portal de Luz and some of the Geronimo Jr. It. Right. And I just I said, guys, put your energy into the book, please. <clears throat> I couldn't put it on oh, top because it was. Show... I don't know if they can see it. You can kind of see the. See yeah, the... that's the amethyst go right there. Yeah. And um, <laughs> with Portal de Luz. The blue is kind of like my rings, right? Sort of like the. Right. The blue is on the pyramid. That's kind of. And that's yes. just. A version of the Mitchell Hedges skull done in blue. That's the only way I could could get an image of it. So they can I, tell tell them your web address and where they can find you. Okay, so the play the best way to get the books is to email me crystalskullexplorers at gmail dot com. Crystalskullexplorers at gmail dot com. Gmail dot com. Mm -hmm. Okay, all the free ebooks. I have too many of them. You have to email me. So I can send you an email with direct links how to get them all. Because there's a Crystal Skull book and all kinds of other stuff, too. Uh, especially the one you want to read is with the two special experiences, which I didn't really get to talk about. I just told you we're, about the We're going to do song. several more of these. We have to right, go now, so, but we will we'll put that in part two. Because right, by now, then, people can get the books and they can read them. Right. And then you can talk about it a little more. Right. Now, the website is CSE, like Crystal Skull Explorer, but the letter CSE dot Crystal Skull Explorers, and that's plural, Crystal Skull Explorers dot com. So that'll take you to the website. And if you click on the shop menu, then you'll see all the books that we have. Or, you know, if you're curious about this one, which is, by the way, called Miss. Um, Journey of the Crystal Skull Explorers, travel log number two, search for the blue skull in Peru. Mm -hmm. okay, that's the full title. Um, so if you're curious about that particular one, then, um, you know, I can either order it for you or we can make an arrangement or you can order it off the, the website too. you know. Whatever. So one more time, your email is crystalskullexplorers at gmail.com. And... We are talking today with Joshua Shapiro, and Joshua has had an extraordinary life journey with crystal skulls, unlike many people, and he's been exposed to some of the greatest crystal skulls known at this time in history on the planet. He's had his own experiences, and you can even get a crystal skull. If I were you, if you like this idea of crystal skulls, or if you like them in general, you could get a skull that he's getting in now soon and the book and you could have you could have them both and trained by his by his right. skull and that's kind right. of cool and <laughs> they're, in, in, they're like in, tools they're like especially right. the little ones they're like you know how people hold their round crystals well you can you can have your your little skull the skulls that you and i talk about are a little bigger which needs two hands but um these are wonderful and you're about to get some new ones in right 
Right, I should be receiving in April two boxes from the Indian carver of more skulls. There'll be an ET type of skull that comes in and also for the first time he's sending me an assorted colored, different colored stones. I was so seeing that when you first said that, I was actually seeing that. I was seeing like a whole bunch of different kinds. And yeah, like seven different colors of skulls, I think he's going to send me, which are a different gemstone. So, you know, I'll have pictures on all of them. And the key is if one is meant for you, you will just, I don't know what there is about it, but I just feel like I have to have that one. Because I tell you, I get all these skulls and I go, there's no way they're going to find their homes. And every single time they do, like I have two larger ones right now that are over two pounds that I haven't really tried to promote yet. And they'll find somebody will just say, yep, that speaks to me, you know, even though it's because the price of them is by weight. Okay. And the clarity of the crystal. If the what crystal is and all that. Yeah. Absolutely. Right, if it's a quality crystal and it's heavy, it's going to be more expensive, but you don't have to have a large skull, you know, especially if it's your first one, get a smaller one and work with that and see what it's like. And then it just takes you where you have to go. When I got Portal to lose, I never thought I would be here with 30 of them. Okay. You know, and most of them, I, I don't have a big room to keep them in. So most of them are in their boxes or cases <coughs> and they're all excited because when I go to Tampa next week, I can take them all out and I can display them. I'll have two tables. So where are you speaking in Tampa? It's called Sacred Space Tampa. That's the name of it. So again, yeah. if anybody's listening and you're in the Tampa area and you might want to go, it's by donation. This group meets like every Thursday and they do something. They're great people. So this is my first time to be in Tampa. So I'm very excited about it. And love it. Uh, you can, again, email me and I have a flyer for it too that I can send you. I make these, when I get to do these talks, I get, I make flyers. And also, if you're by Orlando, then the next one after that, it'll be on the 11th and 26th of April. I'll be in, um, God, I forgot, is it Windhaven? Something like that. It's just south of Orlando, like maybe 20, 30 miles. I'm going to be doing some talks at uh moon dream 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 moon moon dreams with a z so right. um so you know it's starting to pick up a little bit oh it's gonna place. pick up <laughs> we're gonna go on a wild trajectory so what do you think of this solar eclipse that coming well since i think the sun is underneath the dome i'm not sure what to make of it it could be they're talking about this because there is going to be some um, disruption of our communication systems. And so they have to have an explanation for it. So I don't know if it's necessarily going to be from the sun's vibrational frequency or something else. But, you know, there is some type of major event that's getting ready to come that's just going to blow the truth open on everything. I think it'll be more galactic based, like Pleiadian ships will be showing up everywhere. Mm -hmm. because they're around us they're just cloaked they're i think so cloaked. too i think the um there's going to be several timelines i think there's going to be converging timelines that get played out here yeah. and some they've known for a long time and some are actually kind of new based on our choices that we have created in the last two years and i think that there's the old but then there's some new budding timelines that have just popped up as potential right i just don't see the reality that we're living in what it's based on lasting for very much longer because it's based on a lot of untruths and lies it's not not based on how the reality really is so it's in the process of falling apart right now well That's to me it looks like it's like the 70s when you think back of the 70s and everything that was in the 70s it seems so far away and so like shag carpets? Are you kidding? It feels like that in terms of the timeline, the way it is now. It's we're just accelerating at warp speed. I mean, totally cosmic speed, right? Yeah, yeah, it's going much faster, and we just have to take it day by day, and just recognize 
that it's God's will to bring total peace and harmony to the earth. We don't need to know exactly how it's going to happen. We just need to know we're headed in, a, in that direction because that's what R just shows me. It's completely that way where he is and he's in 2037 to 2040. That's like only 15 years, less than 15 years maybe from now. So it's not that long for it to happen. So how does that work then if he's your future self and you are going to live longer with the med beds? It means you don't leave or you do leave or how does that work? No, it just means you're going to live longer. You're going to have total health all the time so that you can focus your life on all the things. No, but you, really... you personally, because oh, oh. if it's 15, me, 15 years from now and you're oh, going to live I'm longer, here... then you right. would technically still be in this body. Yeah, that's right. But it'll be in a higher vibrational frequency. And myself told me I'm here for 200 years and I'm only going on 69. Oh, so I goodness. still have over 100 years to, to stay here. You're a lifer. Wow. That's right. amazing. Well, Joshua Shapiro, and I wanted to introduce him to everyone because he has these beautiful books in a, an amazing journey and a beautiful heart. And so we're going to be talking more with him about different things, but we've covered a lot of ground today. We've talked about his journey. We've talked about the skulls. We've talked about the history of the skulls. We've talked about the 13 and we talked about the orb the atlantean orb so we will have more for you upcoming and in the meantime you can email him directly and you can email him at crystal skull explorer at gmail.com so explorers plural crystal plural. skull explorers at gmail.com thank you crystal skull explorers thank you so much god bless you and everyone go jolly keep it smooth and we will talk to you again soon Thank you, everyone. Bye for now.